Have you heard that there's a new company that will turn the ashes of your deceased loved one into a diamond for you? That's right, for a couple of grand, they will create a diamond ring from the carbon extracted from a family member's ashes. They'll even do it for a pet. What compels us towards these extravagant and expensive funerary rituals? The conversation with Dr. Claire White that you're about to hear is truly unique. She's a cognitive scientist of religion and the first CSR expert to hold a position within a religious studies department in the United States at Cal State Northridge. She seeks to understand why certain religious beliefs and practices occur cross-culturally and how they impact human behavior and well-being. But a prominent focus of her research has been around death. Now, perhaps a warning that if you've recently lost someone close to you, the scientific language used to analyze human responses to death may be uncomfortable for you right now. But overall, I found Claire to be a really helpful and sensitive guide to this uncomfortable topic, and ultimately how death rituals relate to human thriving. So if your fight or flight is kicking in just at the topic of this episode, it might not be as bad as you think, but of course, take care of yourself if you think it will be too much. Ultimately, all of this is about meaning making. How do we make sense of love, death, and the value of a human life? How do our traditions and stories infuse the intense experience of grief with the transcendence and meaning we need to survive and thrive past a devastating loss? Lastly, this recording contains a presentation and the slides are referenced throughout that presentation. A link to the slides is in the show notes for this episode, but please be warned that it contains photographs of corpses throughout. I'll let Claire speak for herself, and so we'll just dive right in here. My name is Sari Martin Concepcion. I'm the Director of Communication at Blueprint 1543, and you can find more resources like these on our website, blueprint1543.org. Your faculty profile boasts that you are the first tenured position in the area called Cognitive Science of Religion in a religious studies department. So that's interesting. They have you in the religious studies department. Yeah. You know, I think that now more and more there is this need for interdisciplinary research and just acknowledging that we don't all have one, no one has the one tool to solve the problem that we have. And we have many problems and many opportunities for research, like especially this topic called religion, it's huge. So I think that position really was a part of a, a broader acknowledgement from scholars of religion, and especially in my department and in my university, that really there's such a fruitfulness to interdisciplinarity. And so I'm not a religious studies scholar in the sense that I don't come from a religious studies background. So it was indicative of this acknowledgement that different disciplines can really speak to problems in this domain called religion. Yeah. And I'm sure you get like a lot of jokes about being like the death lady or something (laughs) because it has like this macabre thing, but also yeah, you know, that might also, I don't know. I'm not the sec, I'm not a psychologist. So defense mechanisms, I don't know. But death is such an intensely like it can be, it's such an intense, the feelings around it are so intense and personal. And I just wondered if before you kind of launched into like your whole little lecture you're gonna do, um, if you could just kind of share like what led you to this particular research interest and like what kind of attracted you first to studying rituals scientifically and then death in particular and death rituals in particular. Yeah. It's funny that you say that because I have to be really aware. I mean, I'm going on a trip tomorrow Yeah, and thank God for Kindle because um, before I remember reading hardback books and actually taking the books out of the cover in order to ha- disguise what I was reading when I was traveling, because de- death is one of the few things that we know for certain, right? I mean, we're all going to die and, and it's a really uncomfortable thought and emotion to connect with that we are not immortal it's 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 a deeply difficult 
recognition and by and by reading it and by talking about it you are i am in a sense flaunting it in people's faces and people don't want to be reminded of this not in the western world and i think a lot of our culture is built up on on kind of disguising and camouflaging and distracting us from the idea that we are all mortal but part of my broader research agenda and one of the reasons that i'm really passionate about this research area is that I think that it has real life implications for people, right? And that I'm part of a kind of broader, I guess, theoretical political agenda that is let's make death and talking about death more natural um, like other societies and let's make more better informed choices about how we die and what happens to our bodies and what happens to the people we leave behind. Because I believe that it's better for psychological health of the person who is dying and the people around them. So I got into studying this kind of deeply depressing topic. It is depressing, right? But there are people who study cancer at the end of life, biologists, you know, oncologists, right? Epidemiologists, and they're not hiding what they do. So um, studying the psychology of grief um, and death rituals uh, should also be acknowledged and celebrated, right? That's not the case. Um, so getting into how I studied rituals. So I actually was in Queen's University, Belfast, and I was studying psychology with anthropology. And so I would go to the psychology lectures and think, oh, this stuff on rituals is really interesting, but I really wonder why they're not listening to the stuff that I'm hearing in the anthropology lectures. And then I go to anthropology and think the reverse, right? Um, and there was a guy called, a guy, professor, a guy professor called Harvey Whitehouse. And I came and I approached him and I said to him, you know, this is really interesting, your theory on rituals. And I find rituals fascinating because they're, they're part and parcel of society, right? No matter what society you're in, there are rituals. And I said, have you ever thought about, you know, having some empirical testing and psychology to try to test the theories that you have? And he said, actually, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And so I kind of got folded into that um, network of cognitive science of religion. And death rituals, in some respects, they came natural to me. Because, look, of all the rituals that we participate in, if death is inevitable, then death rituals are really fascinating, right? And 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 compel our attention as humans. They're part and parcel of almost all societies that have been documented. And they really say, you know, there's a famous saying that some have discredited, that you can tell how a society treats its people and, and how kind of enlightened a society is by how they treat their dead, right? But that aside, I think you can tell a great deal about human nature by how we participate in these rituals. And as I was starting to engage in this research, I had a personal experience where a friend died and I happened to be there. And I remember going through the actual motions of what I was researching at the time. So I was doing things like, this isn't a joke, wake up, right? And, and I made some decisions about the process of letting him go that I think with hindsight really reinforced and kind of pushed me into this direct direction from a more personal agenda, right? Of look at the research really dovetailed with my personal experience. And so that just reinforced the direction of death rituals. Wow. So much of you said just makes so much sense to me. And especially now, you know, as we've had like this pandemic that gives you a sense of like death all over the world and the way that we receive information now where we have access to so much information about tragic things that are happening all over the world. And we can't even process it. Like we can't even think about like a hundred thousand people dying or something like that's, it, it can kind of short circuit us, I feel like, which is why I think we're seeing a lot of like mental health problems or whatever. But anyway, I'm not going to be, you know, just no, you're theor right. theorizing. <laughs> you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So one research project that I'm actually engaging in right now is looking at just that. It's looking at how is has COVID-19 and this pandemic and the restrictions placed on what I think are universal tendencies towards ritualized behavior. How is that going to impact our grieving? And to give you a shortcut, 
you just gave me the answer, which is I think it's going it's going to have detrimental consequences. And so one of the takeaways that I think is going to be interesting for those who are watching or listening to this is that rituals are deeply embedded and deeply ingrained in our culture. But part of the reason for that is that we have these deep psychological yearning to perform these rituals when someone has passed. And the meaning making behind those rituals, so the theology, the doctrine, the motivation, it's really informative and it really enriches our understanding of why people perform these rituals. And even in the absence of that issue, when we take a step back from the detailed descriptions of why people perform certain actions, understanding psychological predispositions really enriches our understanding of why people do certain things and why people feel certain things when they come to um, say goodbye to loved ones. And COVID-19 has really impacted our ability to do that and it has impacted the role of what I would call not just legal authority, right, but traditional authority. So charismatic figures, church leaders, priests, officiants of ceremonies to come in and to kind of stamp an important, they're there as a representative of of a transcendence, of of God, of of a higher power, of kind of channeling that meaning-making system right? And kind of representing it. And the fact that their role has now drastically changed, right? So virtual ceremonies, or they can't be present, um, right? At the start of the pandemic, people couldn't even hold ceremonies. And if they did, they were much different. Giving final rites in hospitals, I've seen devastatingly sad um, pictures of, you know, for example, priests giving the last rites through an iPad. And this to me showcases one, how detrimental it's going to be for moving forward when we start to see the impact of our death rituals being decimated by this pandemic, but also again, reinforcing the human need, the compelling need to have um, these rituals and to have authority figures who are representative of belief systems integral to those rituals. And in many cases, uh, religious figures have been willing to risk their own lives alongside uh, hospital staff and medical care practitioners in order to deliver, to be part and parcel of these rituals, because that's how important it is. And that's how important they know intrinsically it is for people to complete these rituals prior to and after the death of a loved one. Yeah, it's that important. It's that important. Okay, well, you were going to do a little tour of your research for us. So why don't you just go ahead and launch into that? I'd love to to hear more. I'm going to share my screen. Cool. All right. So this is what is other people have commented the most depressing title slide that they've ever seen with the picture. And I totally agree. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, we're dealing with something that's real and something that's really sad. And um, this is the reality of it. So let's go on a detour of my research of mortuary rituals. And as other people have commented, this slide is very depressing, but I think we're dealing with the reality of a a sad subject. And so maybe it does it justice. So if we look at mortuary rituals and we ask, what are they? There's many responses to this question. And I think at the most basic level, Mortuary rituals are a conventional action following the death of an individual. So they're conducted prior to or after corpse disposal and even after the corpse is dug up in some some ceremonies and then reburied, double burials. So there are a little bit more details to this, but for now, I think we could just say it's a conventional action. And this is a man in Madagascar burying his child in his family tomb. As a psychologist, I have another theoretical take on what mortuary rituals are. 
So what I would say, and I think this is one of the key take homes of my chat with you today, is that they're culturally learned practices. So of course they're culturally learned, that's first and foremost. However, they harness the human psychological preparedness to perform them. So that is to say, even though they are culturally learned, there is a human predisposition, human tendencies, human drives, right? Human preparedness that when they meet this cultural input, they really take off. And so what I want you to do is I want you to look at the following, I think there are three or four slides, maybe four. And I want you to consider what you think the main similarities and differences are in these examples, right? So as you're watching them, just think what is similar about these mortuary rituals and what is different. And let's see what you come up with. So the first one is preparing the body. And here's an example of preparing the body by sprinkling water from the Holy Ganges to achieve absolute salvation in India. So we have the behavior, and then we have the kind of cultural explanation or the kind of higher level supernatural explanation of how this dovetails. We have another example here of manipulating the body. So it could be touching, changing the position. And here the example given is by tying hands together so that the deceased voodoo priest cannot practice voodoo with other corpses in Haiti, right? Next, we have uh, viewing the body. And here is viewing the body during a three-day wake in the Philippines to pay respects to the family and to the deceased. And I should have warned you that this is going to contain corpses, but it's very difficult for me to talk about death and making death part and parcel of our discussions if I'm going to hide it. So I'm giving you real photos. Next example, similarities and differences. Community ceremonies around the body. And here the example is taken from Madagascar. And it's a seven-year ritual where people re kind of, they dig up their deceased loved ones and they rewrap them in shrouds very expensive silk shrouds, might I add, and they write the name, their names on the silk shrouds, you can see them here, in order not to forget the deceased loved one, right? And that's the belief system here is that that's a way to remember the person before they join the ancestors in Madagascar. Actually, in the West, we have a very strong biological conception of death as a momentary switch from life to death. In a lot of other cultures, they're really focused on social death social death of the person leaving their immediate environment as an as an important uh, relation another relationship partner and so they believe that that transition is very gradual right it's not instantaneous and hence this every seven years rewrapping the person and here we have the disposal of the body which of course is another central feature in mortuary rituals and here we have these gentlemen who are escorting this coffin up to a hole dug in a cliffside. And in this particular example, it's from a high status individual. And the reason that they are carrying this body up to a hole dug in the cliffside is because they believe that the deceased should leave the world in the same way they entered it in the Philippines, right? And so that's, it looks like a, a track. Okay, so now I asked you to consider what are the main similarities and the differences in the examples that I provided? And so what I'm going to do is I want you to just think about those for a moment. And I'm going to talk you through what, as a researcher, I see as the differences and the similarities and how I come about obtaining that information. So let's look at the differences. So you might have had something on your list that is somewhat similar to these two groups of actions, or groups of sequences and actions, right? So the first one is local explanation of actions. And that is really the details of the belief system. So why do you have to have holy water from the Ganges, right, to cleanse the person? Why doesn't ordinary water work? And, you know, that can be tied to the belief system of the supernatural and what happens after life, right? And the second is the action sequences themselves. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the action sequences themselves because I think that's pretty obvious and not as interesting as local explanations of events. So you might have had something when you were thinking about the differences that kind of fit into these two. You might not have stated them this way, but probably something to do with differences in the actions and differences in, in belief systems and, what, and how people caretake their dead. And so 
we also are interested in similarities. And so what I've done is research called, I've called it the science of mortuary rituals, looking across the globe and sampling different kinds of cultures that are representative of all the world cultures, right? So statistically, we take a sample, we look through documented evidence of mortuary rituals, and we try to find the similarities across the globe, right? So what are the similarities? So if you just look at the differences, you can see that they're two and they're pretty broad. But, and if we were just to focus on those differences, we would think that really culture is driving all of these practices and culture alone. It would be pretty easy to come up with that conclusion. But if we look at the similarities, we can see there's a whole host of similar features about these practices that, that are obvious if we kind of look beyond this, these, kind, these differences. So, for example, I said before the first key feature of rituals are that they're conventional practices. And I said there was more. And here's the more. They're highly stipulated. So people around the world perform mortuary rituals in very specific detail. They have to do something a certain amount of times, right? They have to get water from the Ganges at a certain time of day. They can't just get any water and it can't be from any river, right? Very stipulated behaviors. They're redundant. So sometimes you have to wrap the body three times or seven times or nine times when one time would be sufficient to wrap the body, right? In terms of material outcomes. They're also disconnected from everyday goals. That is to say, you know, if we look just at purely function, so if I want to turn off a light switch, I, I flip the switch, right? It wouldn't make sense for me to kind of twirl around three times, touch my toes, walk to the end of the room, and then, then touch, touch the switch. And that's what happens in mortuary rituals and in rituals in general. Okay, so these four stars really are what characterize rituals in the context of death. And then that's why there are so many similarities across cultures when it comes to disposal of the body. And they're also performed in groups. So you might've noticed that in all of the examples, there were people around, the body is central. The body is central to these rituals. Uh, they happen prior to disp disposal or in redisposal. They're always, so local explanations of actions are differences, but they're also similarities that there are explanations for these actions. People aren't just doing them blindly, right? There's some sort of explanation. And also they're costly. And I don't just mean financially, but financial happens too. I mean, in terms of time, energy, resources, finances, and so on. So let's look at the differences. So if we're just to look at the local explanation of actions, you know, we, what we could say and what psychologists, oh, sorry, social scientists often said was that mortuary rituals are really a product of shared ideas about the self, the process of death, the identity of the dead in the afterlife and the identity of the living, that is what is driving them, right? However, there's a bit of a problem and that there's inconsistent evidence for the relationship between kinds of afterlife beliefs, like a parallel land of the dead in another sphere of existence and specific kinds of mortuary practices like washing the corpse of double burial. There's no clear relationship between people's belief systems and their practices, right? It's not as clear cut as you would think. And actually, when you ask people why they perform these rituals, although, like I said, they assume that there is some meaning behind the actions, they're often vague, or they say, someone else knows, or someone else did know, or go ask that person they know. And this is similar to a lot of our rituals, right? Like, why do you, um, let's just take the example of uh, Christmas, right? Why do you put presents under a tree at Christmas? Uh, well, maybe someone else knows, or there must be a reason, right? And, and so on and so forth. Same with rich mortuary rituals. But these local explanations are important. So local explanations and, and theology does often con converge with psychological tendencies. So when I said they're culturally learned practices that harness this psychological predisposition, I think that often the explanations are there and they converge with the practices that we're engaging in, right? So why do we have the body as central? Well, it's important because of this. Why do we touch the body? It's important because of this, right? They're, they, they often converge and not always. For example, some Buddhist traditions stipulate very limited interaction with the dead person at the start of the burial practice. And despite that, some research shows that people still touch the body, right? There's this compelling need to touch and see. 
And so let's look at an example. So why are mortuary rituals resilient? So they're found in about 97% of all world cultures. And as you can see here, this is what we did in our research. So we documented what level of contact is there with the dead person, right? Is it, is it just watching the person? Is it touching, kissing, holding the person, which would be moderate? Or is it actually taking apart the person's body, which would be, you know, some rare practices in like some Amazonian rainforests? And so we found that, you know, the vast majority are moderate. And, and you can see here that this is, I love this picture. This is a picture of a man in the Philippines. And as you can see, this garment here, this mask has become synonymous with COVID. But here he's actually taking it down to touch. This is a secondary burial of his son, who is obviously deceased. Um, and this is many years later. So this showcases to me that even when disease, infectious diseases are high, people still have this compelling need to touch and be with their loved one because this was his son, right? This was his son. So of course he wants to touch him in a loving manner. Like we touch our children. That doesn't stop just because he's able to represent his son as, as dead. And we actually find that when disease prevalence is high, mortuary rituals as a whole don't change. So the level of contact doesn't change. We were talking about COVID-19. And even though, so the West is an outlier because we have professionalization of, the, of our rituals and in actually the vast majority of cultures and pre-19th century, the United States did not either. So kin, family were responsible for actually burying their loved ones. And so we can't really draw from the example of the modern West. You could say, oh, well, during COVID-19, people weren't able to touch their loved ones and they weren't able to participate in these ceremonies. Yes, that's because we have this highly legislative, professional outsourcing of our funerals. But in other cultures, there really is no relationship between disease prevalence. People still want to bury their dead and touch their dead, right? And so they're highly resilient. And that's not the case, by the way, with romantic kissing and greetings. They decrease when disease prevalence is high. And so one reason why is looking at local explanations and theology. And so we can see that when we surveyed cultures across the world, again, we found that in most cultures, and this is a special, this is small scale traditional societies, okay? So remember the modern West is an outlier in the world when it comes to rituals and how we treat our dead. So let's look at traditional small scale cultures. And they actually have ideas about the recently dead that reinforce why they should practice these ritualized behaviors, right? So most fear ghosts, most think that ghosts harm, predominantly through biological means, so they can infect you with diseases. And also the one of the main ways to prevent supernatural harm is through performing scripted ritualized actions. So this is an example of where the theology really dovetails with psychological predispositions in saying you can avoid being biologically harmed or psychologically harmed through performing the correct burial practice. So if you do this ritual correctly for your deceased loved one, you will not be harmed. And so that's a really nice example of where the two dovetail. And so other research that we've done looking at similarities and then looking at what functions do these practices serve, look beyond the details of local belief systems and doing things like cross-cultural surveys and interviews and ethnographic research. And so, you know, really looking at the similarities here, I like to think of them as what are the psych, what, what do we mean by psychological preparedness, right? What, how can these similarities tell us about psychological preparedness? And I'm not going to go into detail on the research that we've done, but I'm happy to elaborate on it. But we've taken surveys um, cross-culturally to see what are the similarities and what can they tell us? And based on this research, we have, when I say we, I mean my collaborators and I, so Dan Fassler um, be the main collaborator. So what, what, what functions are there? What benefits do mortuary rituals have in the modern West, beyond the modern West, for people who perform a certain kind of action and for others, for people who are Christian, for people who are non-Christian, right? What benefits do they serve? And these benefits are pretty universal depending on whether or not people kind of meet these psychological predispositions. So the first thing we think is that they actually preparing more... Uh, it, performing mortuary rituals 
shortens the period of grief and it regulates the period of grief. We think that performing mortuary rituals helps people and communities regain feelings of control in the face of threat and uncertainty. And we also think finally that performing mortuary rituals helps us to identify group members, strengthen our commitment to the group's ideals. So for example, could be theological doctrine about the power of God, right? Facilitate the formation of new social bonds with other people. And I'm just finally going to talk a little bit about each of these three. So the reason we think that they shorten and regulate the period of grief-induced disability is because we've done some research with people mapping kind of the symptoms of grief and the outcomes of grief, and we're still doing that. So we know that grief is detrimental to health. It really is detrimental to health. It can even predict mortality, right? And it's also detrimental to survival in our past when we were in small groups. It also removes the person who is grief struck from the environment. And that means that they can't contribute to the group. And that was really important in our ancestral past. And it still is. Look, if you can't go to work, right? If you can't take care of your children, if you can't feed yourself, you're really not in good shape. You're in your, and your mental health is, is detrimentally affected. You're really not able to participate in society and take care of yourself and your family. But we also know that there's this compelling desire that we all have as humans to see the body. So on the one hand, the body is your loved one and you want to see them and you want to be close to them because that's what you've always done. And on the other hand, you kind of have this healthy skepticism because of your emotional bonds to that person, because of your relationship, that that person is dead, right? You want to see them to check, are they really gone? And then there's also this third aspect, which is you're afraid of the body. And you might be afraid because also culturally you're told to be afraid of it because we don't talk about it because of this contamination avoidance, because corpses after a period of time can be disgusting and they elicit feelings of disgust. And they're also a manifestation of our mortality. Like we were talking at the beginning, it's really scary to think about the fact that we're going to die. So corpses are really this kind of juxtaposition between what you want to see, what you want to touch, and what you don't, the familiar and the unfamiliar, right? Relationships with others and the fact that you're not immortal. But there's this compelling desire, and we think ritual conventions to see and touch the body because the interaction with the body diminishes the duration of the grief. So these are the early stages of grief. You know, we're, we're yearning, we're compelled to be close to the person. We really almost have an addiction to be near the person and touch the person and talk to the person, right? And of course, in religious frameworks, that relationship shifts. But before it shifts, we have the body. And even in, this is a gorilla, even in non-human animals, we can see that there, this, this desire to touch and manipulate and be close to the body is, I think it's a predisposition, right? For all the reasons that we discussed. But interaction with the body does one thing, and that is it provides a kind of visceral cue cognitively that helps us in this skeptical position to register and recognize that the person is in a changed state, and that can be the case as well, spending time with the person at the end of their life and then being there when this transition happens and then spending time with the body. So it doesn't have to happen directly after the person has passed, can be up to the end of their life. But interestingly, and so research has shown relationships between interaction with the body, even though in the short term, it creates more emotional distress long-term grieving outcomes tend to be better. Now, I say that with a very broad framework, so really up to clinicians and clinical bereavement practitioners to advise people on what to do based on the circumstances, like if the death was traumatic and so on and so forth. Um, but in general, that's what we see. And also we see that in cultures where they have a final funeral ceremony, it's associated with better positive health outcomes and, more, and faster reintegration into society. And so they also help regain feelings of control in the face of threat, because as I said, there's this ambivalence and a ton of research has shown that performing scripted behaviors is automatic in the face of threat. So you'll often see themes of cleanliness around mortuary practices. Performing scripted behaviors, basically what it does is it 
swamps working memory so that you're flooded with the next procedural step in the action. And it kind of temporarily distracts you from thinking about the fear, the uncertainty, the broader framework of what's going on. Now, when you do this as a group, it actually promotes affiliation, emotional bonding, when you're doing synchronous actions, all of that stuff that we see in mortuary rituals really reinforces group cohesion. And so through doing these scripted behaviors that are automatic, right, that are, you follow the procedure and you're focused on doing it correctly, it reduces anxiety and provides regained feelings of control. And again, interaction with the body as part of this diminishes the duration of grief. And finally, it really provides opportunities for costly signaling. So you can see this grieving husband and your automatic reaction were that a friend of yours, of course, is to hug and to hold and to give resources. You may try to provide things to people like childcare, financial help, emotional support, all that great stuff that we know that we flourish as human societies with. And so it really provides these mortuary rituals aren't just about the body. They provide people with opportunities to give resources to the bereaved, and they also provide opportunities for costly signaling. So remember the gentleman I showed you in the Philippines carrying that coffin up that difficult hill, that ter- navigating that terrain? They're showcasing their commitment to not just the deceased, but to everything the deceased stood for and to the family. I remember uh, I went to a funeral once, I flew in unexpectedly, and three of my friends had taken the day off work. They did not know the deceased, traveled three hours, and I thought, wow, they're really committed to me, right? And that's what funerals do. They provide opportunities for this. And we also know that um, affiliation reduces stress. So being in groups, hugging, offering resources, and also eventually they then allow replacement relationships. And that sounds quite cold, but it's really not. Isn't it remarkable that we as humans have the capacity to love again? Isn't it remarkable that we have the capacity to engage in new relationships? Around about 12 months, grief predictably subsides. You know, a lot of people say you don't get over it. You learn to live with it. That's absolutely true. But the symptoms of grief, those predominant taking you away from your daily activities tend to subside. And then you can engage in what a kind of cold cognitive way of putting it is replacement relationships. Replacement just means, I guess, on a social level, like is it a new husband? Is it a new child, right? But of course that word is a little bit deceiving. And so finally, we talked a little bit about this, but looking at the importance of the psychological predispositions, no matter what the doctrine says, you know, no matter what explanation we give, even in a time where we are in the midst of a pandemic. We were in the midst of a pandemic, I can thankfully say. So we have professionalization and professionals come in and take over our debt and take care of our debt and all these regulations and CDC recommendations and state level requirements and navigating all this legislation that really is not there for the majority of societies. Even when we have that, even when we have all of those higher level Uh, dictation of what needs to be done with the body in order to keep us safe. You can see that there is still a priest and he is on the left-hand side and he is giving a, a kind of summary of the loved one's life and trying to comfort the bereaved and give a framework for their experience. And that really, to me, is is just a pictorial representation that we need these rituals and that even in the face of adversity, we still crave our rituals and we crave meaning-making frameworks of what has happened to the person and what is going to become of the person after their life on this earth has ended. And most cultures, almost all cultures, I would say all, but that's up to debate, have ideas about what happens to the person after their body has gone. And these rituals really deal with the body. But then, of course, We need some sort of meaning-making framework to understand what happens next. And so I think that this is a really poignant picture to demonstrate that uh, that happens. Thank you, Claire. That is an astonishing presentation. (laughs) It was really... Depressing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Depressing almost doesn't do justice. It's almost more like um, just like existential dread, I might say. (laughs) Yeah. You know, there is... I think that... 
if you acknowledge that you're mortal and that you will die and that others around you will die, there is an opportunity, a real opportunity to think about these questions, to try to find meaning, to try to think about what way you would like to be honored at the end of your life. So for example, this is really morbid, but if I was going to do an advanced directive or a a funeral plan, knowing what I know now about the study of rituals and knowing what I know about the benefits, thinking about the people I would leave behind, I would definitely want a group ceremony, right? I would want some sort of meaning-making framework. I would want a religious authority member present. I would want people to provide resources to my family, all of that stuff, right? And I would want them to do whatever they needed to do ritual-wise in order to help. And so now we see even the rise of secular rituals. We see the rise of hospices, volunteer staff coming into families and saying, what rituals would you like to have happen? So even if we don't have these conventional rituals, there's idiosyncratic rituals like lighting candles for people or photographs of them around their bed or holding hands and saying a prayer, right? You can create your own rituals that are meaningful. And I think that religion really provides a great framework, a wonderful framework where we don't have to come up with our own, right? And it so happens that these rituals are positive for mental health. They have great social benefits and they are, but they are in a meaning making framework that you have to accept. If you're going to perform the last rites in a, in a, and have a Catholic priest come to your hospital bed, it doesn't really make sense unless you, you know, you engage with that meaning making system and that you believe in, you know, all of the, 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 the Catholic church, right? But Still, you could have something similar if that isn't your belief system. You know, you could have a a beautiful goodbye ceremony by your family. So I think religion is great at honing in on these positive mental health benefits. And no matter what the doctrine is, and although that is important for meaning making, they really dovetail on these psychological predispositions, which is one reason why I really have this great against scholars who you know, popular scholars coming up with these criticisms of religion. And when people say religion is this, religion is that, or, you know, religion, uh, looking at the downsides of quote unquote religion, it drives me nuts because, you know, all the research that I do showcases that religion is a meaning making system that also harnesses in this context of mortuary rituals or psychological preparedness in order to deal with one of life's probably, I think, the most difficult, predictable human experience. And uh, so we can harness the benefits of it. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think just, I can't help but think that we all have this, it must, it's connected to our desire to feel that our life is meaningful and that we are valuable, maybe is a better word. Like we want, we want to feel that our life is valuable. And so our fear that maybe our life isn't valuable is reflected in how we treat other people's death. Like no one wants to feel like they are disposable and death makes you feel like people are being disposed of. Right. Um, <laughs> Remember those scenes from India during COVID? Now, but you can look at those from an aerial aerial perspective and say, oh, those bodies are just being disposed. If you see a close-up of the faces of the family members, they are absolutely traumatized by the loss of this person. And you're right. Funerals are not for the dead. They are for the living. And I firmly believe that. That's one thing that my research has really reinforced to me and so, of course, one huge sense of, of, of torment is the idea that our lives do not have meaning, right? That our lives are not valued by others. And the idea that others are going to be deeply affected by us and our influence and our character and our values, I think that's really um, a, a deep driving force for why we want to honor people. I mean, okay, I'm going to give you a personal snippet here. So, you know, my mother is actually terminally ill right now. And, you know, like we're talking about mortality, she will pass. And, you know, of course I'm devastated by that, but we, we kind of have this propensity to prepare. So I'm thinking, okay, I need to get a funeral dress. Right. And I went to get a funeral dress and it was like $25. I can't buy that. It's too cheap. Right. And I walked away and I thought to myself, wait a second, why does that matter? Why can't it be $25? Why does it have to be 
a designer, slick dress, right? And I guess I reflected and I thought, you know, I bought it anyway. I put it in the bag. I thought, okay, well, there's one and maybe I'll get a more expensive one. And, you know, it, it kind of reinforces to me that it's about showcasing your, your how much the person is. But even if the person can't see the price tag on your garment, you know how much you paid. I mean, this, I, I know I'm laughing, but it's just, it's just mm-hmm. a, a simple example. You know how much you paid for that outfit, right? But when people can see the commitment that you have, then it really matters. So mm-hmm. can you imagine, for example, a father who has lost his son, who says that he has a dislocated shoulder and can't carry his coffin? Think about his reputation, right? Mm-hmm. Or for example, mm-hmm. if you can see how much it costs. So people spend fortune, a fortune on funerals because it showcases to others and to them the amount of value in their minds that they place on the deceased, right? On that, on that loved person. So we have right. all sorts. And so I say this from a non-judgmental, a sincerely non-judgmental place because I just did the other thing. Um, when I went to get that dress, we do it all the time and it's unconscious. And when you reflect on it, it can bring a different level of awareness for you to then say, well, how else can I value this person? What else can I do? Right. Showcase my commitment to them. I can't get over like how different the West is uh, in contrast to some of the examples you gave. And especially like in my own experience in the United States, just growing up and I've been to more memorial services where it was all focused on the person's life and there's photos of them alive all over the place and stories of their life, but the body's not present. Um, sometimes maybe in the urn already. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a viewing, of the body, the goal is that they would look asleep, right? right? The (laughs) the morticians make them look like they're They're alive. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, um, that's just so interesting that that is, you know, interaction with the corpse to really get that sense of the reality Mm. of the person's is not very present. No, it's not. Um, so, you know, when you were talking about this memorial services, they're a really important facet of grief. And one of the differences, I think, in the modern West and traditional societies is that, you know, you have this. So in other societies, you kind of have a period of around about a year where there's stipulation. So you don't speak the deceased name or you get rid of their property or you move out of your house or you kind of there's a socially stipulated appropriate period of mourning that lasts about a year. Think about the West. When someone dies, if you are lucky, you get, what, two days off work. So they're saying, and in other traditions, it's different. So like um, in Jewish traditions, they will sit Shiva for seven days. So, you know, give or take, I'm just giving broad examples here. Sure. But then you return to work and you're expected to be a fully functioning individual in, in, in your work. And of course you're not, you're devastated, you're suffering grief. And so one big difference is how culturally we kind of mandate and regulate and try to shorten this period because it serves, I mean, we're in, you know, Unfortunately, it serves purposes of organizations who are there, for the most part, not all, to make make money, right? And then second of all, we bury the dead and then we kind of leave it up to individuals to commemorate them in most circumstances, right? So I think these memorial services are a wonderful example of how you can regain control of remembering and commemorating. And why do you need the benefit of all of these rituals just once. Why not have them, right, at certain periods? And in other cultures, they have double burials. So like I was showing in the photographs, they'll actually dig up the body again and have another kind of funeral with the body present. You don't need the body present to reap the rewards of of the affiliation, right? Yeah, and another difference, I guess, in the modern West and traditional societies is that we try to hide death and we try to camouflage the body so that the body looks lifelike. And that's a really difficult problem. And it's difficult because you're going to have this emotional ambivalence no matter what the body looks like. But if the body has signs that it has been damaged, it is really uh, traumatizing in some instances. So there is a difficult kind of navigation that goes on here. And that's why I say clinical bereavement practitioners are the best people to advise on this. But generally speaking, I really have started to now look 
generally speaking, end of life also matters. And so my research is now spilling into end of life because I suddenly realized that actually in the modern West, we tend to live longer and we tend to have predictable, more predictable deaths. And that offers opportunities for us to be there towards the end of life and to, to start this ritual, this the bet to start reaping the rewards of rituals before the person has passed. And so in that case, being with the person as they transition can be really beneficial to people, right? Um, So you don't necessarily need to see the person in some sort of bad state or a cold corpse. But if there's an opportunity to be with the person as they transition, I think that that can be really beneficial for someone to see that transition without the fear, in most cases, associated with what happens. That reminds me, I once went to a, I guess, like, I don't know what you would call it, but a memorial service before the person had died. Uh, she was terminally ill mm-hmm. and very at the end of a, and she, I think she had said it was from a Hawaiian culture or something. I don't know, but they basically, it was just like going to memorial service, but she was there. So it was very, um, very emotional, but very interesting. Yeah. I, I think that where we attuned to what's going to happen, we probably would do the same thing. And um, you know, my 40th birthday is coming up and I always think, oh, this is kind of like a funeral, your last chance at a funeral, right? Like you have everyone there, there's a big celebration, people talk about you. And I think, you know, and maybe my mind has been, you know, <laughs> contaminated by all this research, but yeah, it's 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 a shame that the person doesn't get to hear and see all of these wonderful things about them. But of course you can pay your respects to people at the end of life before they pass. If death, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a funeral for them, right? But you can certainly have an opportunity to tell Mm -hmm. a person what you would say, uh, give them their eulogy, Mm -hmm. right? In a disguised fashion, you can absolutely do that. And that's really beneficial. Yeah. I don't know what my last question is, but I want to kind of say a little more about the meaning making around the rituals. It seems almost like it's secondary. Like you said, a lot of people do the rituals and don't, aren't sure of the meaning, but they're sure there is a meaning, you know, and yeah, they feel a compelling need to do it. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I don't know. I'm just wondering about that relationship. If it's like reverse engineered, do the people who do know the meaning, is it, I don't know what I'm trying to ask exactly, but I'm just trying to understand that relationship a little bit more. Yeah. I think that, um, So it's not that there's this psychological preparedness that happens and that the meaning making comes secondary and that we think, oh, what's the meaning behind this? That's too clean, right? That's too Mm -hmm. simplistic. You grow Mm -hmm. up in a culture. So let's take the Christmas tree example. Why do you have a Christmas Mm -hmm. tree at Christmas and why do you put presents under it, right? Um, People get excited and they engage in these rituals and you say, well, why, why a Christmas tree and not something else? And of course, you may grow up in a culture where if this is really important, you will hear people pass down the meaning and explain and reinforce why that tree, why there, why does it have to be a real tree and not a fake tree and all this stuff, right? So it's really cognition interacts with culture, right? So your predisposition interacts with the explanation to give rise to these practices and reinforce them. There's seldom really one without the other, right? If you have what we see is culturally widespread behavior. So let's take mortuary rituals, right? It's not like we just have the predisposition because if you had, let's take OCD, someone, you know, someone else is going to say that you are dysfunctional. If you have ritualized behavior that takes off, takes over your life and you're just compelled to keep repeating these actions, you know, why are you doing this? You just feel compelled, right? That's what it looks like to the extreme. So we don't have that. We have predispositions, but then we have cultural socialization, cultural input. We have doctrines, we have authority figures like priests and religious figures that reinforce what we're doing, right? They provide the meaning making framework. And so even if you don't know the exact details, you need to know the details to put it in your meaning making framework. So culture provides a meaning making framework. For example, you know, if I switch off my light and you ask me, well, how exactly does that action change the electric current to your light bulb I have no idea right and in the same way when you ask someone so why does wrapping the person in that expensive silk shroud help them transition to the afterlife 
Well, the person might say, well, I don't know the exact details of that. Someone else does. Like I would tell you, okay, go speak to an engineer or electrical engineer because I have no idea, right? There's an electrician somewhere that can give you the info. Well, they might say the same thing. So it's important. We're not trying to denigrate or downplay culture because people don't know the details because we don't know the details for, we run around with the black box theory of, of, of most technology, right? So really people have meaning making broad frameworks, although they have yet to work out the exact details of those that are enough, right? The, the idea mm -hmm. that there is something beyond the physical body, the idea that, that, that by doing something to the physical body, you are helping the person transition to the other world, or you are helping to um, pay your respects to that person, but the details don't really matter. And the psychological predisposition meshes really nicely with this broad framework. And so these rituals take off. And that's why we see so many similarities in rituals across the world. Thank you, Clara. That's also interesting. And I, this has been such a great talk. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for <laughs> Thank you. having me and I hope you're not too depressed yeah. for the rest no, of the day. I'm probably going to think about it a lot, but I'll be okay. <laughs> Um, this isn't, this is kind of a tangent, but I think the stuff about ghosts is really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of folk beliefs in ghosts. That's not like, like I have a theology degree. There's like pretty much nothing in Christian theology that is reinforcing like the idea of ghosts or if that is even a possibility, most Christians mm -hmm. would say it like the, on the books answer is no, you know, <laughs> but that, that idea that ghosts are, or could be real is pretty ubiquitous. Yeah, it is, especially in traditional small scale societies. The yeah. idea, there are a lot of ideas about ancestors that are really similar. So you have a person, an aunt or an uncle, and they die. And when you think about it, of course, there's going to be a, a tendency to think about ghosts, right? So yeah. you have a person you love. Yeah. You all of your folk psychology tells you that the person is not their body, right? There's this tripartite view of self, or yeah. at least a dual view of self. You have the yeah. body, and then you have other stuff. Let's just call it other stuff. So mm -hmm. essence, whatever. Yeah. Theology, you know, will all, all, will dovetail with this, right? So probably your theological perspective. Oh, okay. Well, the, you know, body is not the soul, and the soul is separate. Okay. And then now you have a person who has died in front of you. Well, the body is there. And mm -hmm. something else has gone and has left them. And it's really a conundrum. And so where is it? Yeah. Where is it? Right. <laughs> where is it? And then, you know, as humans, we kind of have evolved in this state to think about agents everywhere. Right. And right. agents cause things. And so you have this tendency for agency. Where did the person go to? Sure. It's really not surprising that these ideas take off and that also if someone's been a huge part of your social environment for your entire life, it's really almost impossible to stop representing them as in your immediate environment in some way. Mm -hmm. So again, that's another predisposition. And like in the these, mind itself. Exactly. And in these traditional small scale societies, of course, they have these meaning making frameworks where they talk about the person becomes an ancestor, they're in your immediate environment. And actually, they say that the dead person is dangerous because they haven't quite transitioned. So that's why they perform rituals. Yeah, that's interesting that a lot of times that it is threatening and scary if they are reappearing in your community or environment. Right, right. And then they transition and then they're in the another environment. So yeah. Okay, last tangential thing. And this is <laughs> this is adjacent to your research. So if you don't have anything to comment on this, but fear of death research is really interesting to me and especially that people report certain spiritual experiences or sometimes psychedelic experiences or experienced meditators or people who say they experience NDEs like near-death experiences say that they no longer they you know a byproduct of that is no longer fearing death and I just wondered if you had any information about that I just think that's such an interesting phenomenon right I can talk about I can talk very broadly not from my own research yeah. but I'll give you my personal opinion on this I think that experiential information is much stronger from an evolutionary perspective it should be something that you have with your senses something that's evidence to you in your in your emotions is much stronger it can lead to a much stronger conviction than um, higher level 
knowledge, right? So for me, for example, I could read about near-death experiences, what happens after for 20 years, and still not have that experiential conviction. And I think that fear of death is universal and that fear of death, whether consciously or unconsciously is present, it's present in the environment, whether we try to disguise it or whether like in Tanataraja, we have corpses all around us. I think there is a universal deep in seated fear of mortality. So you have that fear and then you have trying to reason propositionally and reason about what happens. But then some people have these deep experiential, spiritual, religious, extraordinary experience, whatever they attribute it, um, that might be, you know, might be triggered by drugs, might be triggered by different ways of having an altered state of consciousness, might be in a specific environment, right? And I think that that experiential sense of if they have a, a, a positive experience and not everyone does there are some reports that people actually have the opposite experience and that's detrimental um, but in these cases I think they're in the minority so let's just say the majority people can experience this deep sense of bliss and awe and contentment and yeah I, I 100% believe them that after they have this experience if they attribute that experience as this is what it's like after death. Oh, I'm no longer afraid of death. Mm. I think what they're no longer afraid of is the process of dying. Mm. But there's a fear of the process of dying. And there's a fear of no longer existing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No longer existing isn't over, can't be overridden by a kind of experiential sense of this is what it's going to feel like. So yeah. I think they still would have a fear of non-existing. That's really interesting. I was thinking about that too, because I had a conversation with a friend recently. My background was like very, very conservative Christian reformed. And I remember a church leader talking to me about these two ways of thinking about the soul, like very strongly dualist kind of thing. And, and that there were two Christian ways you could think of it. And one is that when you're conceived, God basically like pops a soul into you at the moment of conception. Mm -hmm. And the other view was that actually like there's basically spiritual material that your parents give to you in addition to your bi biological material. Oh, really? sort of like a combination. I've like, had never mm. heard of that before, but that mm. I thought that was so interesting. interesting. But then I, it got me thinking about the idea of reincarnation and stuff and how I prefer to think that there was like pre-existence is possible. But of course that's because it's part of that, like that non-existence um, anxiety. So Right. And that's a really strong <laughs> psychological obstacle. And, you know, unfortunately your predispositions and what you tend to think and what you want to think don't really predict the way the world is. <laughs> so even being aware of the biases that you have towards accepting some doctrines, yeah. towards accepting cultural practices and all that stuff, it's really important to keep in mind because it makes you aware um, from an evolutionary perspective, how we are predisposed to think doesn't predict truth, it predicts survival. And I guess, you know, from theological perspective, these predispositions don't necessarily predict truth. They just mm -hmm. explain how we tend to think and a motivation is how we want to think, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that sure gets dicey on the road to <laughs> trying to figure out truth, uh, <laughs> which is the business a lot of us are in. Anyway, Claire, I'm sorry, I went a little over time, but I no, really no. appreciate Thank you so much. your sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much. This has been fun. 